Hello everyone. In this video, I want to talk to you about the difference between EC2 and Lambda functions in AWS. Uh, so this is a particularly hot topic these days, especially as folks tend to be trending more towards Lambda functions for their compute needs. But I think it's useful to have a discussion to talk about what the key differences are, how EC2s and Lambdas work, and how to decide over one or the other, because I really don't think this is a black and white decision. I think there's a lot of factors that go into deciding whether or not one or the other is appropriate. So my promise to you is that if you stick this video out to the end, you're going to have enough information to make a well-informed decision as to whether or not you should use one or the other. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. And the first thing that I want to talk about is just a brief introduction of what EC2 and Lambda are and how they work. So let me just scroll down here a little bit so we have room. Uh, I want to start this out by talking about EC2. Um, so EC2 stands for Elastic Cloud Compute. Elastic Cloud Compute. And you can see here that it has two Cs. Two Cs, that's where the C two comes from cloud compute and elastic cloud computer ec2 for short started in 2006 it is the third product 2006 it is the third product of amazon um, the first was sqs uh, which stands for simple queue service used for message orchestration between applications the second being s3 which is a raw data store and the third being ec2 so now let's quickly touch on a practical example of why EC2s and on-demand computing in general is such a powerful concept. Um, so let's assume that we're a big retailer that has a long period of the year where sales are relatively flat, and that's followed by a period at the end of the year, probably around Christmas time, so November, December, uh, when things really get busy and pick up. So the period here represents your flat predictable sales, uh, and then it kind of raises in November and December, and then it drops back down again over here, and then here's the end of the year, and after the end of the year, the cycle kind of repeats itself. Um, so you can imagine in this region here, when things start to pick up, you need a lot of extra resources, right? There's a lot of compute capability that you need to have to host your backend services, your web apps, everything there, in order to meet the demand of all these orders that are coming in. Uh, so if you can imagine during this period and that I'm kind of shading in here, there's a lot of wasted resources, right? Wasted in the context of, you know, in this period, you're not using those resources. Now, traditionally, if you were just a normal company that's not using cloud computing, you would just buy a bunch of hardware that allow you to deal with these spikes of volume. But as we saw, this would mean that for most of the year, you aren't even using half the resources that you just spent that money on. And this right here is why EC2s are so powerful. You're able to scale up quickly and easily when the demand on your system is large and quickly release that capacity down when the demand on your system lowers. So now that we talked a little bit about the history, let's talk about like what you can do with these machines, right? Because you're renting machines to use for whatever reason that you want. Um, so you can use these these machines to do things like host a WordPress site, right, which is pretty popular these days. Or you can do things like host a MySQL database, right? Or you can do something like make a web app or a backend for a web app, right? So you're flexible here. You can do whatever you want. Uh, so when you're using EC2 machines, you're, you're the owner, you're managing them. Uh, so if you're renting these machines, you need to worry about security vulnerabilities. So security. And you also wanna make sure you're, you're properly utilizing these machines. So you need to worry about your CPU utilization, your memory utilization, your disk space. There's a whole bunch of things that you really need to worry about if you're managing these machines. Uh, but the neat part is that you get a lot of flexibility. Like I said before, you get to do pretty much anything that you want on these machines. Let me just scroll down here to make a little bit more room. Okay, don't want to lose that. That's perfect. Okay, so yeah, we, we have increased flexibility, but that comes at a cost of so security, CPU, and memory. Um, and we also get to kind of pick what type of machine we want to rent. So it can be a uh, compute tier, which is good for, you know, obviously the name implies it's got a better processor, or we can use the memory optimized tier. Or we can use GP, which stands for general purpose. And there's a handful of other ones as well. Each of these have their different pricing models. And within each tier, so say for instance, memory tier or M tier, you have different options like a small machine, a medium machine, large machine, XL machine, 8XL. There's a whole bunch of different types that have different amounts of resources to perform whatever job that you need to perform. 
Um, so when you're deciding to use EC2, you get to pick between all these different types. And that usually requires that you need to know what am I trying to do with this application? You know, if it's a database, maybe it needs more memory optimization because it caches a lot of resources. Or maybe you have kind of an unknown use case or you're not really sure yet, so you just want to stick to GP. So these are the decisions that you have to make when you're deciding whether or not to use EC2. You got all these different things to worry about. Um, so let's take an example really quick. Let's say we want to build a fully distributed back end for a web application. It's got a load balancer in front of it and all that. So what does that look like on AWS using EC2 machines? And this is important because I'm going to give you a comparison example of what this will look like for Lambdas in a moment when we get to them. Um, so what do we need to do in, it, in order to make this distributed web app system? Uh, so we're, we're going to need what's called a load balancer, a load balancer. And that load balancer is going to have target groups within it, target groups. And within target groups, you can have multiple different ASGs, which stand for auto scaling groups, auto scaling groups, ASG, right? And within each auto scaling group, that's finally where your EC2 machines sit. EC2, EC2, and this one similarly, maybe it has three machines as well. Um, and so this is one way that you can use EC2s to build a distributed web application that can serve potentially thousands of requests. Um, so traffic would come in this way, it would hit the load balancer, load balancer decides which target group, it would go to one of the ASGs, these are scalable, so they'll go up and down, add more EC2 machines, drop them down based on some metric, um, and then it finally hits the EC2, and then the EC2 will get that request, respond, they'll go all the way back out the other side. Um, so this is kind of complicated, right? Like this isn't easy to understand. In order to set this up, you need to know how load balancers work, target groups work, ASGs, availability zones, EC2, security groups, the list goes on. It's like ridiculous the number of things that you need to know. So this is one of the drawbacks of EC2s. Like this stuff is complicated and it's not easy for many people to understand. Okay, so just to sum up what EC2s are, how they're used. So it started in 2006. Uh, it's got a lot of flexibility, so you can use them to host WordPress sites, SQL, web apps, whatever. Uh, you need to worry about managing them. You get to pick which kind of type you wanna use. So you need to kind of know what kind of use case um, you're dealing with when you're deciding on your EC2 machines. And this is what a standard kind of distributed application may look like if you're deciding to go with EC2s. So let's do that, uh, talk about the same things for Lambdas now. Now with Lambdas, um, you usually hear the term serverless, serverless, usually accompanying Lambda functions. And you see here, I put this in quotes and the quotes are important because if you know anything about cloud computing, nothing is serverless. Everything is always running on someone's machine somewhere. What the difference is with Lambda functions is that the complexity that we see down here complexity that we see down here for EC2s is abstracted away from you. So when you when you create a Lambda function, you worry about code, code. So you up, write some code either on your IDE at home or directly in the console if you want. You upload that code and in doing so, you create what's called a Lambda function, Lambda function, function. And with this Lambda function, it's basically a container or an instance of machines that are hosting that code that you just uploaded. So say for instance, you wanna host some backend REST API that'll retrieve some data in a DynamoDB table. You can create a function to do that and upload that into the Lambda console, create a function, you'll get back out an ARN. ARN stands for Amazon resource name, and this will have a unique identifier for the function that you created. And basically you can invoke this function anytime you want to run that code that does something for you. Um, so this is great for small one-off scripts that you wanna run just kind of on demand and not have to run them on your local machine. But it's also great for high throughput applications, similar to what we were talking about down here. So this is a little bit about what Lambdas allow you to do. Let's talk about uh, using the same example here, how you can achieve something similar when you're using Lambdas. And the best part about it is that it's all abstracted away from you. Um, so when you create a Lambda function, you get that ARN of that Lambda, right? That Lambda ARN, that's a Lambda symbol. And then you can put like an API gateway out here and that can tie to this Lambda function so that every time you invoke a REST API on this, so API gateway, 
Um, so API Gateway allows you to build REST APIs. You can point a endpoint of an API Gateway to a Lambda function and boom, in like 30 seconds, you can build a fully RESTful or HTTP API using Lambdas. Um, so this is what they allow you to do. They make things easier for you. Now, if we look at this example here, like this was pretty complicated setting up all this stuff, right? Like how does Lambda get away with this? And the answer is that Lambda abstracts away all of the stuff over here. All of this is abstracted away from you as a user of Lambda functions. So when you set one up, automatically on the back end in the Lambda world, they're allocating a load balancer, they're allocating auto scaling groups, they're allocating EC2 machines. And this is why I say serverless in quotes up here, serverless in quotes, because at the end of the day, you're still running your code on computers somewhere. Right, But with Lambda functions, they abstract that complexity far away from you. So at the end of the day, all you worry about is uploading some code and running it. Um, so that's kind of about how Lambda functions work. And that's the main benefit of Lambda functions. You kind of don't have to worry about a lot of this stuff. Now for better or worse, because there's a lot more simplicity with Lambda functions, you have a lot less knobs to turn in terms of optimization or kind of customization of your compute tier. So the only real knob that Lambda gives for you um, is memory, memory. So you can specify between 128 megabytes and uh, 2056 megabytes of memory on your machine. And memory is really the thing that kind of determines in the Lambda world um, what kind of performance you're gonna get out of these functions. So unfortunately, like you don't really get a lot of options here. Whereas like we saw in the EC2 world, you get to pick all these different machines, right? But again, this is the penalty of using Lambdas, more flexibility, less complexity. Um, so if we scroll down a little bit here, so the last distinction that I wanna make between these, and this is probably the key takeaway of the video, is that what we're really talking about here is the difference between flexibility, 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 and maintenance, maintenance. So. Now with Lambda functions, are they flexible? Well, not really, right? So Lambdas have low flexibility and low maintenance, right? So it's good because it's low maintenance, right? This is a good thing. Low maintenance is a good thing, but low flexibility isn't really a good thing, right? Um, so this is the key trade-off. You're, you're getting lower flexibility at the cost of not worrying about how this stuff works for the most part. When you get into some very high throughput applications, you need to kind of start worrying about how, how Lambdas work. But for 99% of you, you probably don't really need to care about this stuff. Uh, now in terms of EC2s, how does that rank? right? You get high flexibility, right? You can do whatever you want, like we talked about before. But, you know, there's a lot of maintenance, which sucks. And this is bad. This is bad. We don't like a lot of maintenance. But we do like lots of flexibility. Um, so these are the key distinctions between the two, right? So you get higher flexibility with EC2s at the cost of maintenance, and you get lower flexibility with Lambdas at the cost of lower maintenance. So that's the key distinction between the two when you're trying to make a decision. Do you wanna worry about maintaining this stuff or do you have a very specific use case where you need to finally control the resources in your machines? If that's the case, probably makes sense to go with EC2. If you don't really care, you just have a general purpose web app where you're caring about a business domain um, and you're not really sure of the scale yet, it makes a lot of sense to go with Lambdas. Um, so I'm gonna flesh this out a little bit more. Let me just scroll down here so we can talk about this. And in this section, let's use a new color, how about green? Um, now I wanna talk about how to decide. How to decide. Because I just threw a lot of information at you and it, it may not really be clear. We talked about flexibility, we talked about um, maintenance or, or operational burden, but how do you actually decide? And it turns out there's a lot of different kind of points here, or things to think about. And the first one is cost or you know money, which I'm sure we all care about. Um, now with EC2s, the cost function is just the fact that you're renting these machines. So it's rent, you pay rent for EC2s. And you know, this is the EC2 section here. And the other side is the Lambda section. Okay, so with EC2s, you, you rent these machines, right? So the machines have different costs associated with them. For every hour that you're renting this machine, then you pay for that amount. If you have many EC2 machines, then you multiply that by how many machines you have. Now with Lambda functions, you pay by invocations. So number of invocations, number. 
you pay by the amount of memory that you have allocated to those invocations. So memory. And you pay for duration. Duration. So you see here, this is a much more complicated formula than what we have over here. It's like much less complicated on this side because you know you can do whatever you want. Over here, they need to give you kind of a pricing model that makes sense with the product. Um, so that's kind of one of the key decisions you have to make. And kind of like I, I talked about before, the other key one is flexibility. So flexibility. And like we were alluding to before, the EC2s have high flexibility and Lambdas have a low flexibility. So if you turn around one day and you say, I wanna host something else on these EC2 machines, or I wanna change the database that I'm using, that's something you can easily do on EC2 machines. But if you have Lambda functions that are hosting this code, you know you need to write new Lambda functions to, do your, to handle your different use case. Uh, you basically need to reinvent the wheel over here. So this is one of the main key concerns. And another very important one is integration. And integration, let me spell that first before I talk. Um, and so this is perhaps my favorite one. And it's my favorite one because as you may have imagined, I love lambdas. And the main reason that I love lambdas so much is that AWS has made it insanely easy to integrate with other services. So things like API Gateway. Right? You can set up a very quick RESTful endpoint, combining that with a Lambda function. If you're trying to prototype an application, you can hook a Lambda function up to SNS. So whenever someone publishes an event to this topic, it'll invoke your Lambda function. You can set a Lambda function up with SQS. So every time it receives a message, it'll automatically invoke this Lambda function, useful for back pressure or handling bursty traffic. Um, so this is why I love Lambdas, because of integration. Right? You get all this stuff and it's just basically click, click, click in the console. Um, you just set this up once and it just automatically works. Now with EC2s, you don't get that. You don't get integration with AWS services very easily. You need to kind of roll that yourself. Uh, so that's another very, very big, important point. Stars, underlines about integration, because it, it is important when you're making a decision. Let me scroll down here a little bit because I'm already running out of room. Get my green again. And the next one is speed. This one doesn't get talked about enough. So with speed, this is very fast, right? If you want to set up a quick little prototype, it's going to be quick time. Uh, you're going to be able to set up an API gateway and a Lambda function literally in five minutes. I have a video on this and you can literally do this in five minutes. There's, I think, 10 clicks involved in setting up a RESTful endpoint using Lambda functions and API gateways. And if you remember that picture we were talking about before with the load balancers on EC2s and the target groups and auto scaling, you get all that stuff for free. And it's literally, you know, two seconds, 10 clicks. So speed is very high for Lambda functions. So speed to market is something that is, you know, a positive when you're talking about Lambdas. That's kind of not the case for EC2s because like we said, you need to set up all that jazz in order to kind of be able to deliver your product. And the last one is about use cases. So let me just scroll down a little bit more. Uh, and it's about your use case. That's one of the main considerations to take into account as well. And what I mean by this is that Lambdas uh, tend to do well with kind of uh, bursty traffic. So if you have a traffic pattern that looks like this, or one that's like, you know, like that, then it goes flatline, then it goes like crazy again for a short period. This is great for Lambda functions, right? Because you're not, in this period of downtime, so this period right here, you're not paying for anything, right? But with EC2s, if we have like, you know, this is gonna be a traffic pattern. If you have like a pattern that looks like this, where you have a spike that goes up, then maybe in six hours it goes up again, then it comes back down. You're paying for everything here, this whole period, because you're renting the machine by the hour. Um, so this is a kind of concern or a factor that you need to build into your decision. Um, so just to recap about everything that we talked about today, we talked about the key differences between how Lambda functions work, uh, what kind of services they offer, what they do. We talked about that Lambda functions offer decreased flexibility 
at the cost of lower complexity. And EC2 machines offer you higher flexibility at the cost of higher operational or management burden. So if you found this video useful, I have more videos on Lambda functions on how to set up a whole bunch of stuff. I'm gonna put a playlist in the top right here. And as always, if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on next weeks. Thank you so much everyone. And I hope you have enough information now to make an intelligent decision to decide between these two technologies. Hope you have a great day. Take care.